Power of TV, the voice for humanity. Hello, and welcome to the New York Parrot Literary Corner. I am Dustin Pickering, your host and anchor. Today, we have Emily Fortenay, who is an educator, singer, writer, photographer, and activist living in Treaty Number 29 territory, the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabeg. She considers herself a lover of learning, and her educational background includes studies in music therapy, Italian language and culture, music education, social justice and conflict mediation. She is a frequent speaker on the work of refugee sponsorship and the practice of circle keeping in the classroom. Her work as an educator has centered around restorative practices and developing curriculum through an anti-bias and decolonizing framework. She is a recipient of 2018 Anti-Bias Award from the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario and received the Mayor's Award in 2016 for her work on developing community awareness, understanding, and compassion around refugee sponsorship. Her writing also seeks to incorporate these lenses and explores living and right relationship with the natural world, other, and self. Her poetry is primarily free verse and ekphrastic, while her poetry or that, while her photography sometimes serves as the art to which she responds. She prefers to look at nature itself as the canvas. You will often find her along the shores of Lake Huron, running through farm fields or exploring old structures to take photographs and enter into frequently inconvenient and comical conversations with her surroundings. In her poetry, she seeks to share these conversations. Thank you for joining us today, Emily. How is your day going? Hi, Dustin. Thank you for having me. It's going well. The sun has finally come out. <laughs> so oh, excellent. We're enjoying some actual spring weather, which is nice. That's excellent. So is, is, yeah. if there's anything that's not included in your bio you wish to say about yourself, uh, you know, related to your poetry or to you in general, that you'd like to share with the audience, feel free. Okay. Maybe as we go along, things will, <laughs> things okay. will come out. Okay. Yeah. That's a good plan. That's a good, a good uh, proposal there to just let sure. it flow, let it flow yeah. out. So um, you say in your, in your bio, uh, you mentioned having these uh, conversations in your in your poetry. So yes. can you elaborate a little bit on that? What you mean by that? Sure. Um, I have taken to um, just exploring local spaces. And so wherever I happen to be um, at the time, right, exploring what is local to that um, to that space. Um, so throughout life right just having difficult conversations or finding myself in conundrums or um, conflict even um, I typically will take myself to some place that's really loud um, so you know going to the lake sometimes the lake is calm <laughs> but going to the lake hearing waves right and having that kind of block out um, what is going on in my brain as a way to um, just kind of calm things down um, or you know trotting through um, cornfields uh, of snow to catch a photo of the sunset setting behind like an old log cabin or something and and I'll find myself sinking right into the snow so sometimes I have con conversations with um, you know just with the environment around me over what's going on in my head or my heart um, and it answers back sometimes by giving me a shoe full of water <laughs> or a, you know, up, buried up to my, up to, well, up to my neck, maybe not my mm -hmm. head, but buried up to my neck in snow, um, you know, and just kind of just slowing me down um, a little bit and giving me time to think, to think things through. And, and nature is a, is a great, um, is a great leveler mm -hmm, <laughs> for mm -hmm. me. Um, and so those are kind of the conversations that ensue and some, you know, deep wisdom will come sometimes from, you know, paying attention to how heavily my feet are hitting the ground, um, how I'm carrying myself, whether it's with anger or with a bit of a lighter step, um, and, and, and just trying to take all of that in, I guess, while I'm, um, while I'm out and about exploring those spaces. Interesting. And, and speaking of snow and 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 so forth, you have a poem called "Fluid and Ice," and there's yes. some lines in there that I think relate to this. Uh, that this what you're saying. Uh, yeah. This pulls all I have from the darkness, exposing flawed architecture 
And I wondered how how does when you say flawed architecture, what do you what are you referring to there? I think sometimes the thinking that I have a lot of of education, right? When I feel like I don't know something, I go out to um, to seek wisdom from people who do. And then sometimes once I get all of that wisdom, there isn't necessarily the competence or the the thinking that I have enough of it to be able to sit in a space um, and speak well to it or to do it. Um, to do it justice, right? It always feels like, oh, I have to go get the, the next piece of information. Um, and that flawed architecture for me is, is sometimes not having that, that sense of being enough or, um, or knowing enough, feeling like I know enough to be able to, um, you know, to serve whatever is happening in a particular situation. I'm getting over that, but... <laughs> right, I think and that's yeah. definitely a mark of a... a wisdom is knowing your limitations mm -hmm. and you know recognizing that I, I think i've heard it said something to the effect of the, the wisest say i don't know the most often mm -hmm. so i think that that's, that's very true i mean it's because there's so much so expansive amount of knowledge and and i don't even think even collectively speaking you humanity know. really all of it together you yeah. know even the yeah. experts you know things say i really don't know this particular thing you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's it's a wonderful adventure though to be uh -huh. able to mm -hmm. to go to other people, right? And and right. have a dialogue and have a dialogue about those things. Yeah. So there's that. Sometimes I used to call it a, a disease, right? Never never thinking that I that I knew enough or had enough or whatever to be able to sit in a space um, you know, respectfully with other people and and teach or share or guide, right? Mm -hmm. Guiding, you know, as a, as a school teacher or years as a school teacher, um, being able to guide someone into their learning respectfully um, and, you know, where they're at, um, it, that's important. It's a, it's, yes. a, it's a heavy responsibility, right? So it really is. Yeah. Um, I applaud the work you're doing already. Well, uh, thank you. <laughs> a lot of it, <laughs> the struggle is what it is. <laughs> and, it's, and there's moments, I'm sure, of embarrassment as well as, oh, yeah. you know, exalting moments you know beautiful moments where you're just you both both be able you and the student or the person you're in conversation with have an aha moment oh together, yeah those are beautiful you know? those are those are wonderful That's, moments oh, yeah you know? <laughs> right yeah excellent yeah and there's there's another um poem of yours that you sent to us um it's uh it's called building bridges yeah uh i was curious about this poem because uh, there's some fascinating lines um mm -hmm. one of the one of which is um you write about uh, the, uh, the the bridge builders already knowing that the bridge is there, something to that effect. And, uh, you know, you imply that the work of the, the bridge building has already been done. And I'm wondering, I'm curious, what are you referring to there uh, exactly? And, mm -hmm. and, and am, I, am I accurate in that? And, and, and who, am I, who are you referring to or what are you referring to as building the, bri the bridges you're referring to? Right. Um, so... Of course, sometimes bridge builders don't have all the things already started, but right. where my community um, is directly across from, we're a border town, so directly across from, from Port Huron, Michigan. So I have this, we have a, you know, a, a two bridges that span over, um, over the St. Clair River. And sitting there one day, just kind of thinking, okay, well, our border is closed, right? We can't, um, you know, we can't, we can't visit one another. Um, and, and that sense of, of losing, especially with things going on politically and just that gap, um, right? That gap that kind of exists sometimes between us or between neighbors, between family members, between people who think um, differently than we do, um, that there has to be a, a way to span, um, to span that distance or to span, um, to span across it and that there's um, a man named Parker Palmer I'm not sure if you're familiar with him and he talks about people who constantly um, step into the tragic gap he's written several books the courage to lead the courage to teach um, and he talks about people that step into the tragic gap people that are always um, willing to kind of do the work of bridging across tragic spaces um, and so there are the, there, I guess in my piece, there's a bit of an assumption that there are already people stepping or who have already done the bridge building work, stepping into that tragic gap so that other people can walk across it or find a way 
um, to walk across it and not feel burdened with having to do all of the work. But the bridge builders right. build, and then other people are um, be become the people who have to start walking across it and meeting part way. Hmm. Interesting. So it's both concrete and it's also a little abstract mm -hmm. as far mm -hmm. as the goes. There's actually a, a phrase in that um, in that poem I'd like to repeat. Uh, Hope is sure. an action word. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you elaborate on that again? Sure, uh, what, what, sure. When you say hope, it's very fascinating. Because hope is a word that's thrown around quite a bit, but you know, it's not mm -hmm. really. We don't really necessarily reflect on the meaning. So I wondered what you thought of, of the phrase itself. Yeah, I think sometimes hope for me, um, and hope may be the way I see it. You know, oh, I hope you feel better. Oh, um, I hope things go okay, right? Without maybe recognizing there's a whole bunch of work happening behind the scenes to allow. Um, I mean, there's there's the belief, but then there's also the doing that things will turn out okay. So this was a conversation that I was hearing on the radio um, about hope and, you know, how things are just, well, it's all in God's hands or it's, you know, it's all up to fate now. You can hope for it, but there's not really anything you can, um, you know, you can do about it. And I tend to think or have been, um, you know, have have been thinking that there is there is a way to make hope in action so I can hope for something to happen but I actually need to start doing some things to allow the space for it to happen um you know in some of the refugee work um that I do right oh well I hope that things get better I hope that war stops um but I actually have to do some things to um to allow that space to happen right I have to I have to educate myself about um, geopolitics going on, or about ways to help people, you know, avoid um, the conflict that is going um, that is going on. So hope for me wasn't, um, you know, in helping refugees come to my community wasn't just about thinking, oh, well, I, there's nothing I can do, but I'm going to hope that we can bring someone here, and then there are steps that I can actually take to help that happen. Did you have any any um, experience with the Syrian refugees? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. What yeah. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So um, the way sponsorship um, works in Canada, um, there are opportunities for um, sponsorships through people who uh, or groups that have been approved by the government. So they, they have to um, carry something called the sponsorship agreement. They are a sponsorship agreement holder. So they agree to all of the stipulations that come with um, with sponsoring um, with sponsoring refugees. So things like providing you know a year's worth of financial support, um, connecting with community and settlement services, uh, language courses, registering people for school, um, finding housing, helping with finding jobs, just connecting them to everything that we already have. Um, simply, you know, because of where we were born, right? So all of those things that we already do, <laughs> um, we um, sponsors or sponsorship agreement holders um, agree to to do all of those to do all of those things. So at maybe the 2015 mark, right, with um, a significant amount of media regarding what was going on um, in Syria and the conflict becoming. Um, maybe more visible to all of us. There was a real, um, a real push to understand more and to see what um, to see what could be done to you know to allow people to leave um, conflict-ridden spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so the very first family that we welcomed. So when you if you're sponsoring refuge coming into Canada, it isn't only Syrian. Uh, refugees that come in, it's rights people from from all over. But our government um, opened up um, a significant amount of uh, sponsorship ability or spaces for Syrian refugees during that time. So the very first um, family that we sponsored was from Syria. Mm -hmm. And then the second uh, family that we sponsored was also from Syria, of course, not living there um, not living there at the time because they had had to flee. Um, but there are all, 
right? There are all sorts of um, communities and cultures that come as well, but my experience has been with, um, with Syrian newcomers. Hmm. That sounds like a, a lot of work and a lot of uh, you know, interesting learning opportunities as well. So does uh, your experience and work with uh, refugees ever find expression in your literary pursuits? And how does that, those, those uh, you know, experiences with other people that we could call the other, you know, that we don't, you know, how, do, how does, uh, how does that influence your own, you know, beliefs and attitudes about life and other people? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say it, it presents itself in my writing um, because there's, there's a looking for a way to navigate conflict. Um, there's a way to, or, or looking at um, other through a, through a softer lens, perhaps, um, with ways to, um, with ways to build understanding rather than there isn't, I wouldn't say anything concrete where I can say, yes, here's a piece that I wrote about, you know, my experience as a, um, as, as a sponsor. Um, but overall, it's just a conversation of how to exist in spaces um, with people we may not um, align with um, religiously or um, culturally. Um, and then find a way to navigate through, um, to navigate through that space together. Interesting. I think there was a second part to that question and I don't remember what it was. <laughs> uh, and I, I was asking how, how does that influence your, your own attitudes and beliefs about life and other people? Mm -hmm. It certainly speaks to me towards a significant um, interconnectedness mm -hmm. between many of us. Um, there is some, some learning and some work that I've done um, in understanding indigenous communities um, within Canada and then looking at, at the impact that Canada say has um, globally in, um, in mining communities and how it disproportionately affects um, right, indigenous communities you know, in, in a really, really heavy way. Um, and so realizing I live in a country that maybe around the world is seen to be quite, um, quite tolerant and quite welcoming um, and just nice, right? The stereotype that kind of goes with, with Canada. Um, but yet we're, we, we carry some, you know, some heavy um, or place some heavy burdens on communities globally too um, through mining. So seeing that we are connected to others even though we might not necessarily um, think so because we're not living in in that space all the time right that's mm -hmm. that's definitely true I, I you know it's it's interesting you have like a concrete firsthand account mm -hmm. of that interaction um so would you like to share a poem with us sure why don't i read um one of the one of the ones that you mentioned the building bridges okay yeah i really okay. like that poem. Good okay one. building bridges I heard radio hosts talking the other day about hope, about how it lies in God's hands, lives in the land of wishful thinking, is offered up full of wanting that for which it's holding out. A word asking for something, someone, to get us through, into, beyond where we are now. The way we've carried hope sometimes Times implies there's nothing to be done except wait for an outcome. But the bridge builders know hope is an action word. They see the, tr the struggle in crossing rough waters, knowing a few will make it easily across the rapids. Some will drown while the currents pull all others away from the hole. And so the engineers of crossing difficult terrain begin their work creating the hoped for passage over the river of despair. Can you do this? Ask, what work can my hope do? You don't have to build the bridge. That work has already been done. Maybe though, you could walk your hope across it one tentative step at a time. Thank you, that was excellent. Uh, I love the, the overall meaning and the way it's expressed. I mean, there is a lot you know, and culturally speaking, a lot of people would just kind of want to sit around and wait, you know, mm -hmm. for the outcome, as you say, 
and and it seems like it's it's sort of like we sometimes we just don't know what to do mm-hmm. and you're saying oh I'm, you know whatever step you can take you know take that step mm-hmm. and that's a very hopeful message i think you know that i appreciate that poem Thank a lot you. so an, another one that um you had in, in your in your um uh the segments you sent yeah. to us there was an interesting one another interesting one that had some some words of advice whatever you want to call it uh, it's from <laughs> paper boats and okay. it says the wines i found that i that i connected with the difficult also needs good company and rough times yeah that's a very interesting line <laughs> almost yeah. like you know counterintuitive in a way and I and I you know I wonder if you could elaborate on that maybe even read the poem if you would like to do that sure why don't I read it and then we can talk about it is that okay okay Mm -hmm. so paper boats take some time it's yours anyway release the furrow in your brow unclench the jaw you keep firm drop your shoulders held high grab a fresh sheet of paper from the stack inside your mind's cupboard make a boat. Do not labor the moment with, I don't know how. Just begin. Even if you leave it flat, it will float. Place pieces of your day into each fold. Include some good with the bad. The difficult also needs good company in rough times. When you are ready, place it on the water's surface in a quiet way that doesn't need a push or puffs of air to blow it into movement. The water is smooth today and the breeze is quiet. It needs nothing more from you unless perhaps you'd like to share a little wave as it sails away. So the line that you um, that you were talking about, I was thinking sometimes, um, Sometimes we feel alone um, in dark times or really not quite sure, um, like not wanting to burden other people with what feels like a burden, uh, what feels like a burden to us. Or, you know, thinking sometimes about difficult conversations um, I've had in, in classrooms if we're talking about issues surrounding race or, um, yeah how to meet a, a, a friend who is identifying as part of the LGBTQ community and not really knowing how to do that. And maybe sometimes sticking our foot in our mouths a little bit um, when we do that, that sometimes we in shame rather than, you know, sitting, sitting with the person or with the individual or going to someone, you know, seeking out, seeking out those, those wise people um, who can sit with us a little bit through those, through those feelings. Um, and I think sometimes it's easier to to have good company um, in those moments so that we know, I mean, if we don't have the wisdom or the or the know how quite yet, being beside someone who does, um, you know, can give us a, a way to walk forward or a way to walk out of it um, and, and come into knowing it in a in, in a different way. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I really like the poem because there's a sense of like thinking about the paper boat. Uh, you know the image of the paper boat it's something that's kind of frail and fragile if you think mm-hmm. about it and there's there's mm-hmm. lines in there where you say you know, don't even worry if you don't know how to make the boat mm-hmm. don't waste your time just, just do it just put the water put the paper on the water you know make your first yes. again make the first step <laughs> so we're talking again about hopeful action you know I yes. think that would be a good phrase absolutely to good connection <laughs> yes it's, it's, yeah. it's a great poem I, I really thank like you. what you're saying thank you it's, really interesting the way you present it uh do you have any idea what maybe led to that image of the paper boat what brought that out that thought yeah well it was the water that talked to me about that one so I really Mm. do I really do um you know maybe it it sounds a little (laughs) out there um but I really just sitting in, in a space and having whatever is in that space um speak to me or, or lead to a wondering or an imagining. So it was an exceptionally calm day. I, I can picture the, the picture that I took um, in my mind. Um, and there's a groin um, in the water that has been covered for the last um, several years because the water levels have been so high throughout the Great Lakes. Um, but this has, has kind of sunk down and there was a, a guy that was 
kind of a cotton candy sky. Like it was just so, so, so calm. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what made me think of folding paper, maybe just the, the, the calmness or the, or the meditative aspect of you know sitting and doing a, a quiet activity um and then it then it just kind of went from there so yeah <laughs> just went from there mm -hmm. so you so said these imaginings you know they they kind of happen in the moment and yeah. do you write the poem then or do you wait until you know uh -oh. you have something available you write so it's like it's like a snapshot of that moment yeah um i think for me taking the photo um is a bit of the um is the verbal cue for me, I'm really working hard at not trying to fill whatever moment I'm sitting in. I mean, the fact that I'm taking my my phone or a camera right and taking a photo already fills it with something else. But sitting and writing, I, I rarely do that um, in that space. It's a I, I grab the snapshot and then I I walk home or drive home with the words um, ruminating. Right. Um, yeah, inside. And then I then I would come home. That's right when in. you referred to ecrastic in your yeah. bio. Yes. Writing. It's interesting that you write ecrastic on your own photographs. That's that's fascinating because <laughs> most people when they hear ecrastic, it's like a painting or a, something that you know maybe like an old painting from the Baroque era or something. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like so you're 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 taking snapshots of you know things you see and and you're kind of envisioning and letting it speak to you in that sense. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. letting the letting the words flow and and you know and very interesting yeah. uh it's a good it isn't, process it isn't necessarily um i mean I, I use my maybe i'm using my photographs as right as the piece of art but it's actually looking at nature itself mm -hmm. already as the canvas right and the, right. the the photograph just it maybe helps the memory a little bit interesting and so, you know, moving on to another question I had, um, does your work as an educator ever conflict with your mission as poet and activist? Oh, no. Um, no. So they're it's, very compatible. Um, oh, very compatible. So. Very compatible. Yeah. Maybe elaborate no, a little compatible. bit on that. Like yeah, how it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a joy to puzzle through um, how to bring art um, and words into right in into into any learning um into any learning space um the same is true for um the same is true for for activism um the classrooms that i have been in over the last um several years tried to to just kind of flip the you know standard sitting at your desk in rows reading a textbook um, kind of learning. So we'll actually push desks um, away and sit in a circle um, and really find a different way to have conversations about quite complex things. And kids are really quite, um, kids are great knowledge keepers and curiosity keepers um, already. So, you know, we, we push the space back and then we take some time with, um, with building some guidelines um, together, like you know, learning to listen, um, listening to learn or to understand rather than to judge, mm -hmm. um, using respect as, as the basis of, of coming together um, in a space of, um, we use a talking piece, so it might be a feather, it might be a stone, it might bring, be something that um, a student has brought in. Um, and, and we honor that. So if someone is, is holding it, that it's, it's their turn to speak. So they take turns um, sharing, sharing their wisdom or passing, um, you know, passing if they, if they feel like they can't talk um, at that point. And then telling the truth, the truth as you know it, um, and allowing other people to share theirs. So within those spaces, we can have quite complex conversations about, um, about things, so it's not necessarily my activism, right. right? But things that are that are that are happening in terms of, of equitable, um, uh, inclusive um, learning, and and the space is set up quite well for it already because we navigate how to how to deal with conflict, how to deal with a difference of opinion, you know, and it's not about fixing other people, but rather trying to understand the viewpoint, um, you know, or, or what they, they bring to the conversation that might be different from us, but isn't necessarily wrong. Um, 
it, it's a wonderful space. The circle space is a wonderful space to be able to, um, to be able to invite um, difficult conversations and, mm -hmm. and, and a sense of activism into the classroom, right? To break apart, oh, we're looking at whatever it is in history that really has only had one perspective shared. How do we bring in, um, how do we bring in other perspectives? And, and, and that kind of circle space um, allows that to happen quite beautifully and gives us a way to have disagreements um, or big questioning without feeling um, uncomfortable or judged in that space. Hmm, that's interesting. So the kids are, you know, do you teach young, very young people or? Well, up to grade seven and eight. Okay. Up to grade seven and eight, yeah. So they're, they're very, they're open with their experiences. They don't feel, as, you know, you, of course you're saying you don't make them feel like they, they should be ashamed or mm -hmm. reluctant to say what they really think and feel. Uh, about a specific subject matter. Uh, so that invites a lot of, you know, interesting um, angles to things. Mm -hmm. Very interesting mm -hmm. how you do that. Do you find that, that a lot of schools are doing this or is this just like a very personal, you know, activity in your, in just in your classroom or? Right, so for me, it was a very personal um, activity. It was a conscious choice about educating myself differently. Um, and then bringing, bringing that kind of, of, of approach to learning um, into, it was very deliberate on my part. Um, and I, I have done a lot of learning with um, Kay Pranis, who is a restorative justice um, practitioner located in the States um, and, and is a, a, a big name um, in terms of that, the, the peacemaking circles approach to um, to the justice system, to the education system, um, you know, to, to systems um, and into personal spaces. Um, Tanaga Myers and Jennifer Bell, they're already, they are people who are doing the work. So that it exists across, um, it exists across Canada, it exists across the states, it exists in indigenous communities where, where we're learning um, a, a different way of, of uh, being together, um, this is already there, mm -hmm. uh, and and this is it, or it has become a way um, to introduce some of this to um, right to the to the regular classroom. Mm -hmm. And I've read that uh, like in certain conflict zones, you know, not just in classrooms, they bring this sort of approach where they bring the people together yeah. in conflict. Yeah. And it's, it's a, you guys talk, you know, talk about how you feel about being a victim, how you felt as a person perpetrating a crime against another person or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's a lot of, a lot of new, or maybe not necessarily new, but, you know, there, there's more space now for these, these kinds of activities. Conversations. And kinds of yeah. And it really has to be prepared well. Not not every space um, maybe has a readiness for it or a willingness right. to embrace right to embrace it that way. So it really does. You have to do a lot of um, of you know before conflict comes out. You have to do a lot of conversation um, prior to about what the boundaries um, of the space are, right? And, and come up with things together rather than just having a, a way of being or a way of solving conflict um, imposed on you. Right. It, it, it's a very, um, like a consensus building kind of experience. Very, it's fascinating. And, and uh, I just had one question more about mm -hmm. this. It's like, you know, you talk about the preparatory work and the what do you see as far as, I mean, I don't know how long you've been an educator, but as far as more long-term, how does, how does this help students' development in the future as they go forward? And then do they become less, you know, of a, a hazard, I guess you could say, to other people? Like they learn more to be collaborators rather than starting conflict? Sure. Though it also, it's not, it's not only for the person who is, mm -hmm. um, who is struggling, right? But it's also for the people around them to build, um, to build community and a sense of understanding of other, um, right. a way of really not othering the other, right? Further, right. furthering um, distance between, between spaces. I guess the hope is that, um, well, I always used to say, or I say to students and to, to other people um, inquiring about circle keeping or about the, the idea of the circle, um, that the circle doesn't just exist in this space, right? Once you leave, once you leave this room, 
um, you take those uh, you take those values with you. You take that kind of thinking with you. Mm-hmm. So now if you and I are having a conversation and you say something that I think, oh, I don't know how well that sits with me, rather than me formulating um, an opinion that I don't, you know, fill in the blank with whatever horrid adjective you want to fill mm-hmm. it in with, but me thinking, you know, you're, you're not the smartest person. I might sit with that and, and see what kind of, oh, what just came up for me? Why am I thinking? Why am I thinking that way? And instead of responding to you or to whoever with, um, well, you're just stupid and now I'm going to walk away or I'm going to shove you and I'm going to take that anger into other situations. It forces me um, to listen, right? To listen and to say, please help me. I, you know, you said something and I, I'm not exactly sure what you're saying. Can you help me understand? And there is a difference. Um, you know, you can watch um body language settle a little bit when it's when it's tell me more about that instead of I think you're really silly for thinking that way (laughs) right and so to 